I'm Carla Naranjo, Associate Professor of Spanish at the Montgomery College Germantown campus, and I feel so honored to introduce the wonderful and talented author, Reina Grande. As you know, she's going to be discussing her latest book, a memoir entitled The Distance Between Us. But before Reina shares her thoughts, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about this remarkable woman. Reina is an award-winning novelist and memoirist. Her first two novels, Across a Hundred Mountains and Dancing with Butterflies, were published to critical acclaim. She has received a number of awards, including an American Book Award, the El Premio Atzlan Literary Award, and the Latino Book Award. In 2012, she was a finalist for the prestigious National Book Critics Circle Awards. Now, it's clear from all the accolades bestowed upon her that Reina is a talented writer, but one has to ask, where did this talent come from? Where did she find the inspiration and the motivation to write? Well, in a number of interviews that she's conducted with CNN Español and the international Spanish news channel Univision, Reina Grande has spoken about how her life experiences have served as the catalyst for her writings. She has overcome so many obstacles to be where she is today. Reina and her siblings grew up in the town of Iguala in the state of Guerrero in Mexico. She was only two years old when her father left for the United States in order to find work. Later, her mother would also travel to El Otro Lado, or the other side. This separation of family had an enduring impact on Reina's life. Like so many people living in an economically difficult situation, Reina came to the United States by crossing the border as an undocumented immigrant at the age of 10. Once in the United States, she faced a new array of challenges, and one challenge was learning a new language. Reina stated in an interview that, no sabía ni una palabra en inglés cuando llegué. I didn't know a single word of English when I arrived. How did she overcome this obstacle? She read, and she read a lot. She started off by reading children's books in English. As she read more and more, she states that she fell in love with reading. She fell in love with novels by V.C. Andrews, and she eventually was moved to write her own stories. Reina attended a community college, Pasadena City College, for two years, and later she received a Bachelor of Arts in Creative Writing and Film and Video from the University of California in Santa Cruz. She also received a Master's in Fine Arts in Creative Writing from Antioch University in Los Angeles. Her memoir, The Distance Between Us, wrestles with issues and emotions that many immigrants in this country face. The separation of family, poverty, learning a new language, discrimination, and isolation. And as I look around the auditorium today, I believe that many of us in this room may have also wrestled with those issues. Montgomery College is a place where diverse members of the community come together to learn and enrich their lives. We are home to students of working class backgrounds, children of immigrants, recent immigrants from all over the world, and first generation college students. That is why I think it's so perfect that Raina is here with us today at Montgomery College. Her voice represents the many people who have come to this country to escape adversity and to find a better life. Her voice represents those who have struggled economically and have overcome said obstacles. Her voice serves as an inspiration to those who are learning English or any other language to strive to have their voice heard. In other words, her voice is our voice. Please help me give a warm welcome to Ms. Reina Grande. Wow, thank you so much for that great introduction. I'm very touched. Um, buenos dias. Good, good morning. I'm so, so honored to be here with you today. I want to thank the Maryland Humanities Council for 
for this wonderful honor and opportunity to, to be here in Maryland. I've been here for a week now. It's official. I've been here for a week. And um, I go home tomorrow, but I've driven all over the state. And Phoebe and, and Andrea have been driving me around everywhere. So I've gotten to see this beautiful, beautiful state. And, and I got a chance to see um, fall is coming. And, and um, it's wonderful. I live in Los Angeles where we don't get the four seasons, so we don't really get to see um, what you, you guys see here through the year. So it's very beautiful. Um, so as you've heard, I, I attended a community college and uh, I'm actually very proud of being a product of the community college. Um, those two years that I spent at my community college was, uh, were two of the best years of my life, to be honest. Um, I, for those of you who read the book, you know that while I was there at, at my community college, I met a wonderful, wonderful teacher named Diana Savas. She was my English 1A teacher. And when I met Diana, I was, uh, you know, I was a very frightened 19-year-old girl. Um, I had gone through a lot of difficulties when I met her. Um, dealing with, with many uh, family problems and from the trauma of um, what immigration had done to my family and the way it had broken it up. And um, when, I, when I took um, English 1A at my community college, uh, that was one of the best things that ever happened to me because then I got a chance to meet my teacher, Diana Sabas. And what she did for me, for those of you who haven't read the memoir, was that Diana really changed my life. Um, when I met her, my, my family life was very unstable. My, my father was um, suffering from, from severe alcoholism. He was uh, very, very violent, very physically abusive too. And eventually, um, when I was taking this class, um, you know, we started going through some really, really um, bad difficulties at home that ended up with my father um, beating up my stepmother and putting her in the hospital and my father getting arrested. And I remember that night when the police arrived and they handcuffed my dad right in front of me and they took him away in the patrol car, I felt my life was falling apart. And yet the next day, I still had to go to college. I still had to turn in my homework. I still had to pay attention in class. And the whole time, I just kept thinking that, that you know, what was I going to do with my life? And I couldn't stop thinking about my father being in jail and, and just, just feeling so helpless and vulnerable and lonely. And um, I went to look for, for my teacher, Diana, at her office because I needed, I just needed someone to talk to. And, um, and I went, when I knocked on her door and she let me into her office and I shared with her what had happened with my dad and, and how worried I was, um, Diana said, well, why don't you come live with me? And she said that she has seen too many students drop out of college because of all their family problems and she didn't want that to happen to me. So I went home and I packed up my bags and I went to live with my English teacher. <laughs> and, <laughs> And that was absolutely amazing because um, Diana really, you know, provided such a stable home for me, you know, stable environment. And one of the most wonderful things about coming to live with Diana was that I had never been in a home that had books in it. You know, I grew up in a home where we didn't have a single book there. I never owned a book until I met Diana and she gave me my very first book when I was 19. And, um, and at home, the only books I had, as you, as you heard from Carla, I, I love to read. I was a big reader, but I, I borrowed books from the library, and I always felt so sad when I had to take them back, and I couldn't keep them. And there were times when I, when I tried to keep them, but then, you know, the, the, the library fines would add up, and, <laughs> and I didn't want to lose my library card, so I would have, I had to surrender those books to the librarian, even though I didn't want to. Um, but Diana gave me my very first book that I could keep, and that was a very special book. I still have it with me. And um, so when I lived with her, um, Diana was 39, which I'm 39 now, which is inc incredible that now I'm her age. But uh, she was 39, and she lived alone in a, in a three-bedroom house that was owned by the community college. And she had turned one of the bedrooms into a library. And I had never seen so many books in the house, you know, and I was just overwhelmed with how many books she had. 
And that, that first night I stayed at her house, she gave me the house on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. And I had never heard of Sandra Cisneros before. I, I had never read um, the house on Mango Street. And, and as you heard, what I've read was a lot of V.C. Andrews, and, and I read uh, Sweet Valley High and The Babysitter's Club and uh, Stephen King, and there were no Latinos in any of those books that I read. Um, so when Diana gave me the house on Mango Street, I, it, for me, it was a big shock to realize that, oh, you know, Latinos write books. And when I read House on Mango Street, I actually started crying because it was the first book where I could really see myself in it. And while I lived with Diana, she helped me out with my college applications and really encouraged me to, um, you know, to go on to a, a four-year university. And she was the first person to tell me I had talent as a writer. And, um, and she would tell me, you know, that if Sandra Cisneros could do it, I could do it too. So she was my, my personal cheerleader all the way through my time at, at the community college. And um, it was because of her that when I transferred from, um, from, from my community college, I transferred as a creative writing major. Because I had never thought of that before. You know, when I started at the community college, I actually wanted to be an art major, and I was taking a lot of art classes, and I thought I was gonna be a painter or something, you know? And, um, and I remember one time, uh, Diana, you know, she started telling me I should be a writer and I should be a writer and I didn't know what she was talking about because I had never thought of myself as a writer or, you know, and because I didn't read Latino literature, I didn't think that, that, um, that Latinos wrote books. So then I would always shrug it off when she would say, you should be a writer. And one time I remember I was taking a, a painting class so I was working on a still life of vegetables. And Diana came by and she saw me painting. And I was, you know, trying to show off my painting skills. And she was standing right next to me, looking over my shoulder. And I thought, well, now she's going to see what a great painter I am. And she's going to stop, leave, you know, stop talking about, about writing. And then Diana looks at me and she says, Reinita, you're better off being a writer. So that was the end of my art career right there. And um, yeah, so then I decided that I, I, would, I would pursue writing because that's what she, she thought it was best for me, and she was right. Um, so when I transferred from uh, my community college, I went on to UC Santa Cruz as a creative writing major. And when I got there, um, you know, one of the requirements for my BA in creative writing was to write either a portion of a novel or a collection of stories and as my senior project. And I decided then that I was gonna write my memoir and that was gonna be my senior project. So I set out to write this memoir about my life um, in Mexico and then my immigrant experience in the US. And one of the things that really inspired me to write the memoir at the time was that, you know, I, I had been looking for books about the immigrant experience and about immigration. And the books that I would find, they would never talk about child immigrants. It was always about the adult immigrants and what they go through. And they helped me understand my parents, you know, because my parents were adults when they got here. But because those books were not acknowledging child immigrants and their experiences, I, I would get angry sometimes and I wanted to know why, you know, why isn't anybody talking about the children and what we go through? And I felt that, you know, that we deserve to tell our story too and, and you know, and have our voices heard. And one of the things I learned in my creative writing class was that sometimes you have to write the book that you want to read. And that's when I decided to write The Distance Between Us. But uh, when I started the book, you know, I was 22 and, and I didn't get very far because I realized that maybe I was a little young to write a memoir at 22. Um, and it was, and you know, part of it was my age, but also part, part of it was that the events I wanted to write about had just happened, you know, and I was still um, dealing with the trauma, all, all of those things, and the pain was still so raw that every time I set out to write about my experiences, I would just shut down. And it got way too painful to, to write the book. So what I ended up doing was uh, I decided that since I couldn't write the memoir as I wanted to, 
I would uh, fictionalize the story and just turn it into a novel. And that was really the best decision I could do because um, I was able to uh, create a character to stand in for me. And even though I was writing, you know, some out of somewhat, it was a, an autobiographical novel. So I was writing things that, that did really happen to me because I had created this, this fictional character. Whenever the writing got tough, I would always say, well, that's happening to my character. It's not happening to me. And that, that was how I managed to get through my first book. And I was able to finish my senior project and, and graduate. So, so that was wonderful. But, um, you know, so I wrote um, my first novel. It was still um, about immigration. It, my first novel is a story of a young girl who's living in poverty in Mexico. And her father decides to come to the US to look for work so that he can build his family a house, which is exactly, you know, my story of why my father came here to the US. The difference between that book and then and, and the distance between us is that in Across a Hundred Mountains, the father ends up disappearing when he leaves his hometown. He disappears. And my character, Juana, and her mother, they don't hear from him again. And they don't know what happened to him. And eventually, um, my character decides to leave her hometown and go up to the border and try to find out what happened to her father and why he never came home. So that was a story that I wrote. And after I finished it, I was, I was looking at, back at it, and I was wondering, where did that story come from? You know, and, and I was I was really curious about that, you know, like as a writer, like, you know, where 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 did that story come from? And I realized that that book with the missing father that never comes home was really an exploration of my fear as a little girl, because my greatest fear when my when my father was here and I was in Mexico and he was gone for eight years, you know, every single day. I was afraid that my father um, would never return to me. You know, I was afraid that something might happen to him while he was here working, or that he would just completely forget about us and, and not bother to come home. So that was my fear as a, as a little girl, of never seeing my father again. And, and so that's, um, in, in my first novel, I was exploring that fear, and it was answering the question, what if, you know, what if my father had never come home? What would my life had been like then? So after I finished that novel, I, uh, I wrote uh, Dancing with Butterflies, which is, uh, again, you know, it's a story of four Latina women living in Los Angeles. Three of them were born in the U.S., so I was exploring, you know, the Latino experience from, from the point of view of the ones that are born here. And then my fourth character is an immigrant from Mexico. And, uh, and I was writing, again, about, you know, the, Im the immigrant experience and... Um, and I was writing, um, her, her char character was inspired by a really good friend of mine who is uh, extremely talented and he makes um, costumes, dance costumes, and he's always dreamed of having his own business, but because he's undocumented, he hasn't been able to really get very far with his career despite how talented he is. So I based my character on, on this good friend of mine, and so I was exploring you know, what it's like to be an undocumented immigrant in the US and the dreams that you have and, and that you're unable to pursue them because you don't have those nine digits you know, that you need to make your dreams come true. And um, so after I finished writing that, that book, I uh, went back again to my idea of writing the memoir. And you know, 10 years had gone by and I had written and published two books and I thought, well, maybe now I have enough writing chops to get through this book. And I was still haunted, you know, by by the memories of all, all those experiences, um, all the, the the hardships that my siblings and I had gone through. They were still haunting me, and I still had a lot of um, anger, a lot of pain, a lot of resentment, a lot of hurt inside of me. And my fiction, even though it it allowed me to you know to write about some of these things. Uh, because I was hiding behind my fiction and not really confronting the, the, the truth of my experience, I hadn't really healed yet. 
and I knew that by by writing the truth, by by really confronting this, um, you know, and going to the dark places, even though I didn't want to go there, I knew that if I did go there, and if I I could finally, you know, look back at my life and try to understand why things happen, I knew that I would find some peace. And um, so that was the um, the why you know I decided to start writing um, the distance between us, and I did. You know I spent four years working on the book, and when I finished the book, I I just felt like such a completely different person when I finished. It was such a liberating experience, and I felt I had just unloaded everything I had carried with me, all the weight. I had just put it all into the book, you know, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, I just put it all in there. And it was a very healing experience that by the end of the writing, I felt that I had, com I c I had completely um, come to a, a place of peace and understanding and forgiveness. And it just made me such a different person. And after I wrote the book, my, my point of view um, just completely changed, like the way I saw my parents, the way I saw my family, it, it, it was completely different. And that, that book really allowed me to finally be able to, to live a, a healthy life and have a, a, you know, good relationships with my family and especially with my parents. Um, that book was a revelation to me. And when I finished it, I just, you know, couldn't believe, um, how wonderful it's been since then. And, and unfortunately, my father passed away while I was writing the book. But with my mother, you know, I have such a wonderful relationship with her now because this book allowed me to really look at my parents in a way I had never looked at them before. You know, as, um, as I was growing up, I always saw my parents through the eyes of the daughter that had been left behind. And, and so it was through that one lens that I saw them and it was filtered through a lot of emotions, you know, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, a lot of pain. That's the way I would see my parents all the time. And, and you know, there were times when I would throw things back on, on their face, you know, and there was one day I remember when my daughter was four years old, um, my mom had, had come over, she was at my house and my daughter came to sit on my lap and you know, and my daughter at four, she would bring out memories of when I was four. And she came to sit on my lap and she wanted me to hold her. And, and you know, being a little girl, she was very needy and she wanted her mom to, to hold her and tell her that, that she was loved. And I remember when my daughter sat on my lap wanting me to hold her, I looked at my mom and I said, this is how old I was when you left me. And I said it with so much hurt and, and anger, and I wanted to hurt her. And then after I said it, I wanted to take it back. But, but you know, so, so it was like those emotions that would come up, you know, constantly. And yet when I wrote the book, I was able to, to really understand, you know, understand my mom in a way I had never understood her before. And um, when she became a character in my book, I had to stop looking her through the eyes of the daughter, and instead I had to look at her through a writer's eyes, and to really understand who she was, and you know, look at her childhood, and look at the situation that she was living in, and the circumstances of her upbringing, and, and her fears, and her dreams, and everything that made her who she was. And that, that was how I was able to, to stop being so angry, and instead to really start um, seeing her for the human being that she was and understanding her in all of her complexities and really learning to, to accept her. So that, that was, you know, uh, an experience that I, I didn't expect in writing the book. And, and I'm, I'm really um, grateful that I, that I did write it because it, it just um, completely healed me in, in a way that I needed to heal. So, um, you know, this uh, writing, writing for me, I, I, I definitely thanked my, my uh, community college teacher for guiding me down the path because she, she knew before I did how important writing was to me and how it would change my life if I embraced it and if I, you know, pursued that, that path. So.
So um, I'll st I'm gonna stop right there, and I wanna um, hear from 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 you guys. I know a lot of you guys did get a chance to read the book, so I'm sure you have some questions for me, and I'm looking forward to uh, answering your questions. Do you think that your experience um, of your years growing up in Mexico? Do you think that was a typical experience of the, the people in during that time? Mm -hmm. Well, I. I believe so, and I think that, you know, even though what I wrote about in the book, when my parents left and, and I was left behind in Mexico, I mean, this happened 30 years ago, and yet this is happening today, even more now, I think, than 30 years ago when it happened to me. You know, we've had a lot of, of children now, and not just in Mexico or, you know, Central America. This is happening all over the world, you know, everywhere where there's poverty, where there's lack of opportunities, you know, parents are often forced to break up their families and go in search of a better life somewhere else. Um, so I, what the things that I wrote about are, are definitely things that, that are happening nowadays too, and that represent a lot of um, the, the reality of what child immigrants go through. And the thing is for me, you know, one of, one of the things I wanted to point out in the book was how even before we set foot in this country, we've already gone through so much trauma. You know, just, just seeing our families being broken up and, and having to say goodbye to our parents and not knowing if they're ever gonna come back, that, that just creates such, a, such a, a traumatic experience for children because you know, when we're kids, we need our parents by our sides. That is how we, we feel loved, you know, when we have them with us. And, and as a child, you know, when my parents made the decision to come here, I didn't understand why they were coming. You know, I, I knew nothing about the economy in Mexico and how unstable it was. I didn't know anything about the peso being devalued, you know, constantly and, and about um, the recession and the lack of jobs. I didn't know any of that. So I, when, my, when my parents left, what I felt was that they left because they didn't love me enough to stay with me. And it always came to me and how I saw myself. And, um, and I really struggled with that, you know, feeling unloved and unwanted as a little girl because my parents were not there with me. So this is something that, that we're, we're seeing now with you know, our, our child immigrants who, who are coming here um, to the US and, and we've, we've seen a huge number of them over the summer you know, who, who came here and they were escaping even worse things than what I was escaping when I came here. You know, they're dealing with so much violence back home and, and persecution and they're seeing their family members getting killed right in front of their eyes and, and they're, they're dealing with so many um, other things that, that I didn't deal with when I was a little girl. So, but the trauma is there, you know, like just coming here and you've already gone through something that, you know, children should never have to go through. Um, and for me, you know, when, when I came to the U.S., I, I also came as an undocumented immigrant because my parents at the time were still undocumented. They legalized their status in 86 with the amnesty that um, the, Ronald Reagan, um, you know, signed into law. And um, so they, they, they became US citizens eventually, but at the time when my father came back to Mexico to bring my siblings and, and me here to the US, he, he was still undocumented. So the only way to reunite the family was by us coming across the border illegally. And that's how we ended up here. Nowadays, you know, it's so much harder for, for immigrant parents to go back to their countries the way my father did. So what we're seeing now is, you know, a lot of these children that are coming across the border, they're coming by themselves because their parents are unable to go back for them. And many of them um, end up having, you know, to hire strangers to, to, to bring their kids across. And that's something that I think about with my own border crossing that, you know, I was lucky that I didn't have to make it on my own and that my father was there with us. And it was still, you know, a very scary experience. We were still risking our lives doing it, but at least I didn't have to do it alone, which is something that, that our immigrant kids of today have to do. 
And, um, you know, I, I read on the paper a few months ago about this 12-year-old girl who got caught trying to cross the border and she wanted to reunite with her parents and Border Patrol caught her and they put her in a detention center and she hanged herself. And to me, just, just hearing about that, you know, like a 12-year-old taking her own life because she couldn't be re reunited with her parents, it's just, it's devastating to me, you know, what children nowadays are going through. Um, I just would like to know, how do you pastor about the difference in the culture and the language? Because as me, I came, like, I didn't know anything of English too. So it has been very hard, the difference in the culture. So how do you pass through about all that? Yeah, well, well when I first got to the U.S., I, d I didn't even know how to say hello, you know? I, think, I mean, I knew zero, zero English. And it was a, a, a hard experience because, um, you know, when I started school, I started in fifth grade. And at the time, my fifth grade um, school, my elementary school didn't have bilingual education. and. They didn't have ESL. They didn't have uh, programs to help their, their recent immigrant um, arrivals. So when my teacher saw that I didn't speak English, she pointed to a table in the corner, and that's where she sent me. So I spent all of fifth and sixth grade in a corner looking at my class and looking at the teacher talk and not understanding a single word she was saying. And it, it was just, um, at, for me, that was my first time of really feeling marginalized as an immigrant and, and feeling, you know, that exclusion and that fear, you know, and, and I was afraid that I would spend the rest of my life in a corner. And um, one of the things, too, that I dealt with, you know, in terms of the culture shock was that you know, I, even though I was living in L.A., and L.A. is 50% Latino, when I walked into my classroom, pretty much all the students were Latino, too. You know, they all looked exactly like me. They had, you know, black hair and brown eyes and brown skin, and yet they could all speak a language I could not speak. And that was my culture shock, to, be, to look exactly like everyone in the classroom except for the teacher but to know that I couldn't speak the same language as those kids did. And sometimes, you know, those kids were very brutal because they, they made fun of the immigrant, immigrant kids and calling us wetbacks. And, and it really hurt, you know, for people who looked like you and, you know, who were of the same culture to be excluding you too and to, to be making fun of you. So that was my experience when, when I first got here, and it was very difficult. And, you know, because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in the corner, I worked very hard to learn the language, but, but it, was, it was very hard. And, um, you know, I, I tried, and I, I would go to the library and borrow books on tape so that I could listen, you know, as I read, and that's how I learned the pronunciation, because English is just a horrible language when it comes to <laughs> pronunciation. <laughs> as you all know. So I would listen to audio tapes and, and read along, and it's like, oh, so that's how you pronounce that. Oh, that's how you pronounce that. And that's how I managed to, to learn English. And my, my siblings my, my, my siblings were older than me, so they were put at a junior high that did have ESL. So whatever they learned in their ESL classes, they would try to teach me. And they learned English before I did, even though I was the youngest. And it's usually the youngest kids who learn English first. And that didn't happen to me. I, I learned English last. And it was because they were in ESL classes and I wasn't. I was in the corner. Um, so when I got to my junior high and I was put into regular ESL classes, that's when I learned English. That seventh grade, I, I just learned so much there. And then I, I was put into regular um, English classes after eighth grade. But, but it, was a, a, it was a very uh, difficult transition, you know, when, especially when you don't have that, that support. And, and then you're in a place where they try to shame you, you know, into learning English. And, and to me, that, that could be pretty detrimental, you know, and, and I, I see that sometimes with our immigrant kids where they're shamed into learning English, and, and I feel that it, it shouldn't be like that, you know, we, we shouldn't do that to our kids. Your statement that this is happening all over the world because poverty is making families break up, can you address the um, 
societal di difficulties here, especially at a place like Montgomery College that is so international, in terms of having students who have dealt with these traumas mm -hmm. from all over the world. Yeah. And what are possible, what our responses should be. And then the second question is, as in the United States, what do you feel our um, legal or moral responsibility is um, when some of these disruptions have taken place, maybe because of our policies or something mm. like that? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, that's something that I feel sometimes when people are are anti-immigrant or who um, are not su you know supportive of uh, immigration reform or or um, or the U.S. you know um, helping out other countries things like that having you know foreign aid I think a lot of that comes from people not really being aware you know of what's going on in the world and and um, the fact that there are you know a lot of countries where where poverty is what people know and that causes them to have to you know break up their families and and a lot of them don't even have to leave their countries um, you know for example in China you know you you see a lot of broken families in the villages in China because the parents are going to the cities to find work at factories and they leave their children behind with their with the parents with the grandparents and um, so we're seeing like family separation, even in places like that, where they don't have to leave the country, you know, to to separate their families. Um, but the other thing too, you know, as you said, like sometimes the U.S. does things to create immigration. And uh, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in in um, U.S. policy and and um, you know what what's going on. Uh, in in all the countries, but I know, like for example, when when NAFTA was implemented, you know, the North American um, Trade Agreement with the with Mexico, um, there were a lot of Mexicans who lost their jobs because of NAFTA, and you know, a lot of farmers went broke in Mexico, and a lot of them ended up coming here. They had to immigrate here to the U.S. So there are some things sometimes that, that the U.S. does that, that creates a wave of immigration, you know, and then uh, what we're seeing right now with the Central American immigrants is they're coming here because of all the, the violence that's happening in their countries, and, and some of that, you know, is also U.S. created in a way. So I think what we need to do is to really start, you know, being aware of, of what we're doing and, and what can we do, you know, to, to help people stay in, in their homes and not have to leave. Because if you ask, I mean, most immigrants, if you ask them, they'll tell you they, they don't want to come here, you know. They don't want to leave their families. They don't want to leave their countries. They don't want to leave their, their friends and everything they know. They want to stay home, but they can't because they don't have the opportunities. They, you know, they're, they're, um, they don't have a way to support their families, and that's why they end up leaving. And it's not because they want to, but because they have to. So if we could look at what are all the push factors, you know, why, why are people immigrating and, and, and coming here? If we could look at those things and find a way, you know, to, to help people stay in their countries, I, I think, um, I think they, they would really appreciate that, you know, being able to stay home where they could live a, a good life, you know, where they could provide for their families and, and never have to, to break up their families in the way that they're forced to do most of the time. Good evening, ma'am. Um, my question was, um, you spoke about resentment, and I wanted to know if you never had to relive the resentment in your books and when you were writing, would you ever have been able to get over it? Yeah, well, I think when I was writing the book, I had to relive all of those moments. And, you know, it brought up a lot of issues that I had tried not to think about. But I think for me that, you know, when, when I was uh, facing all of those things again and really looking at everything that happened, um, that was when I was able to, to really be able to understand what happened in my life and to understand that everything that happened happened for a reason 
and I am here now because of all those things. And um, yeah, people sometimes ask me, you know, would you change any of it? You know, any any of it? Do you think it was worth it? And my answer is always that, yeah, it, it was worth it because I made it worth it. You know, I, I made some good choices that, that allow me to now as an adult be able to look at my life and say, yes, it was worth it. I wouldn't want to go through any of this all over again, believe me. But, uh, but having gone through it and I felt that I learned how to, how to thrive despite, you know, all of the hardships that life was sending my way. I had a question. I know that um, we, we read the book at your school at my school and we discussed it and had a lovely discussion. Um, I'm curious to know, I know you mentioned you went back to, to your home in Mexico as a young adult. I'm wondering if you have since gone back home and, and what that feels like when you do go, mm -hmm. or if you do. Yeah, I, I, I love going back to Mexico and I like taking my kids with me too so that they can see where I come from. It's a very special time for me when I when I can go back with my kids. And I love going to Mexico because I, you know, I, I reconnect with my hometown, with the people that I left behind. You know, I mean, I, I still have a lot of family down there. And it also allows me to really look at um, what my life would have been like if I had stayed there. And it, it allows me to look at, you know, the choices that my father made and the choices that my family, the, the ones that are still there, what they've, you know, the choices they've made and the consequences of those choices. Because, you know, I have an uncle who I write about in the book, my mother's brother, my, my uh, uncle Gary. And um, my, every time my mother went back to Mexico, she would always tell him to come here because my uncle had, you know, a, a lot of kids. He lived in a little shack, you know, made of sticks with a dirt floor and no running water. And they all lived there in that little shack. And um, he always struggled to find work um, because there were there are not a lot of job opportunities in my hometown. And um, so his family was very poor, and my mother would always tell him, why don't you go to the U.S. so that you can, you know, provide for your family? And my uncle would always say, I would rather be poor, but together. And so he never came here. You know, he never came here. He never broke up his family. His children never had to go through the trauma that my siblings and I went through. Um, but my cousins never finished elementary school. You know, they had to go to work. As soon as they were old enough, my uncle would take them out of school, put them to work, so that they could help them put food on the table. And so I go over there, and I still see them stuck in that cycle of poverty, never really going anywhere, you know, with, with their lives, because they're just struggling to survive day by day. And I think about the choice that my uncle made, and then I think about the choice that my father made. And, and, you know, everything he put us through because of his choice to, to immigrate. But then I think about how, you know, I managed to, to get an MFA, you know, and, and become a published writer and, and do all these things that I would have never done if I had stayed in Mexico. I would be living the life that my cousins are living there now, you know. So, so those are some of the things I think about when I go down there. Um, and it really humbles me too, you know, just being there with them and, and I want to help them, you know, even though I'm here and they're over there, I, I always think about them every day. I think about them and, you know, I want to help them out. And right now I'm putting two, two of my cousins through school. One is in high school and the other one is going to beauty school and I'm putting them through school because I know what a difference an education can make. And, um, you know, and, and they couldn't afford it on their own. It, it's really expensive there. So I try to help them out. And I really hope that one day I can help them, you know, break out of that, that, that poverty, That's, that cycle of poverty that my family has been stuck in for, for generations. So I'm trying to do something about that. And, um, and you know this this December, I I've been dreaming about this for years. I don't know if you, those of you who read the memoir know that um, during Christmas, when I was living there, there was always one person in my town who had some money 
that he could give they could give away uh, Christmas toys. And my siblings and I, we always look forward to that because that was the only toy we would ever get for Christmas if somebody did a, a, a toy giveaway. So, um, you know, for many years now, I've been dreaming about doing that in my hometown and, and, and giving away Christmas toys. So I'm going to be doing that this December. And I'm going to go down there and do a toy giveaway with all the kids in my neighborhood. And I'm bringing my, my, uh, my son with me. And at first he was not too happy because he, you know, he's, he didn't want to miss out Christmas here because they get spoiled and they get too many presents. So I told him, now this year it's your turn to give and not to receive. So that's what we're going to be doing this Christmas. We're going to be giving. So if you guys want to know more about it, you can go to my website at reinagrande.com and, and find out more about my, my Christmas toy giveaway. I'd like to know how your childhood events and life affected your parenting today for your own children. You really want to know my, my parenting issues, huh? <laughs> I, I was just telling Phoebe about all my issues here in the car. So, yeah, no, I, as I told Phoebe this morning, and she, she will attest to this, I told her that being a parent, has been the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. And I'm not ashamed to say it. It is very, very hard. And for me, you know, I think it, 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 it's very hard because um, having grown up in such a dysfunctional family, um, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's tough for me on how to do the right thing, you know, or what is the right thing. And, and, um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes like with my daughter, for example, um, just watching her grow up, it brings out so many painful memories because I'm always comparing my childhood to my children's childhood. And I'm always thinking, you know, when I was her age, you know, and then I think about myself when I was her age and, and, and what I was dealing with at her age. And um, so sometimes that, that comes up, you know, that, that, that pain that I still have and, and that little girl that still yearns for her mother, I mean, she's still inside of me. I'll never get rid of her. So, so then I kind of transferred those feelings onto my own kids sometimes, you know. So I, I do struggle. And, um, and I struggle with, like, you know, even things like, like, like disciplining, for example, where, you know, I grew up in a house where the only form of discipline was get the belt. And that's it. Where, so then, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, abusive like the way my father was. But then I, I have, like, I like the imagination to figure out, oh, well, then what else, bes what, uh, what else is, is there besides the belt? And, uh, and my, fa my husband grew up in a household where there was no physical violence. Where, so he knows all about the timeouts and about, I'm going to take away your favorite toy and, you know, like... <laughs> So, so I always say, okay, you know, you deal with this because I don't want to get the belt and I don't want to hit my kids. So, so then I, I always look to, towards my husband because he, he grew up um, with, with, a, with a wonderful mother who, who, uh, who knew all these, you know, techniques. So, so he knows how to do it, and, and that's really wonderful. And, and my kids are, you know, they're, they're growing up in a very stable home, and I'm trying to do my best as a mom. And, but I, like I said, I do, I'm always comparing my childhood to theirs, which they don't always like that, you know? And, you know, there was uh, one time when um, my, you know, my kids, they have to walk to school, and it's only four blocks away, and for some reason, most parents drive their kids to school which I don't understand. And you don't see any kids walking except my kids. And, um, and I remember one time my, my son was complaining about why did he have to go walk to school? Why couldn't I drive him to school? And oh, he was tired. And then I said, when I was your age, I ran across the US border. <laughs> so if I could run across the border, you could walk four blocks, you know? So I always, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. So yeah, I'm always with that when I was your age story and they know they're never gonna win me at that, so yeah. The 
The government? Uh, no. I don't see that at all. No, I mean, unfortunately, Mexico has always had leaders who are not that interested in the well-being of the people, you know, and, um, and that is a very sad reality, and that has happened since Mexico became an independent republic. I mean, we have seen it with every single leader where they're, they're looking out for their best interests and not for the people's best interests. So <clears throat> they're not that interested in, in helping, you know. And also, I mean, you know, the money that immigrants, Mexican immigrants sent back to Mexico, it's the largest, it's the second largest revenue for the country besides oil. So you know the government's not gonna do anything, you know, they, they want that, that money. They're not gonna do much to help the people. And sometimes, you know, I mean, we've seen, I mean, Mexico, the economy in Mexico is not as bad as it used to be when I was there. So we hear sometimes, right, that, that the economies are better, but you only see that in, in big cities like Mexico City, for example, or Guadalajara or Puebla, or, you know, the big, the large cities. But in, in small towns, that nothing ever changes. You know, my hometown of Iguala is worse now than it used to be when I was there. And I go home and I see worse poverty. And I ask myself, how can this be? You know, how can this be that 30 years later, my, my, my um, neighborhood where I grew up has so many more people living in shacks than when I was there? It's, it's incredible to me to see that. But yeah, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, that uh, our government there is not doing much for, for the people. And the jobs are ridiculously... Um, um, scarce, and the people who do manage to find work, they get paid ridiculous salaries. You know, right across the street from where my aunt lives, there's a large factory there. It's a garment factory owned by a U.S. corporation, and it employs about 500 people, and they get paid $50 a week, and they work six, six days a week, and they're making $50. And so roughly they're making about 80, 80 pesos a day, which is about $8. And you know, and that's nothing. That's absolutely nothing. I mean, a pizza costs $10, you know? And so my family, they can't afford anything because 80, 80 pesos, $8 a day doesn't go anywhere. A chicken costs $8. So how can anybody even buy a chicken for dinner when that's what they make in one day? That's a one day salary. You know, it, it's kind of like if our chickens here cost $80. It's, it's that ridiculous. And, and that's why people can, can get out of that situation, out of the poverty, because there's no money there. You know, they're not making any money. Everything's so expensive. And they're just scraping by day by day, just trying to survive one day at a time. Okay, Raina, wow. you shared how Diana Sabas mm -hmm. inspired you and guided you into your writing, and I wanted to see if you're doing anything like that for Latina writers today to encourage them. Yeah, well, thanks for your question. Yes, um, I'm a, actually I teach uh, creative writing at UCLA Extension, so I try to inspire um, in aspiring writers to to write their work and write put their books out there and just telling them that their story matters and they need to write it down um in terms of the latino um uh, writers i do um, i'm a big promoter of latino literature and i actually um i was i was coordinating a latino book festival for a few years in la and I'm in the process of coordinating a Latino Writers Conference now for next year. And one of the things that really encouraged me to start a, a Latino, you know, start working for a Latino festival and really bring Latino authors together is that oftentimes, you know, there's, a, there's, there's book festivals all over the country, but we're not oftentimes invited to participate. And, and that is always hard, you know, to, to always be excluded from, from, from uh, literary events. 
and for our literature to not be considered American literature and to be, you know, put in a in a corner somewhere of the bookstore and 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 not really be acknowledged as American, you know, writers writing about the American experience. Um, so so yeah, so I I had I was working for this Latino book festival and where we brought you know hundreds of writers, um, Latino writers to come and promote their work. And now I'm doing the Latino Writers Conference for, for next year, so hopefully that'll, that'll be you know, the beginning of, of another thing that, I, that I'm gonna be doing with the Writers Conference. Um, but I'm always promoting um, Latino authors, so I'll promote one right now. Um, Richard Blanco, you guys know Richard Blanco, the poet, the inaugural poet. His memoir just got released today or yesterday. But I encourage you guys to support Richard Blanco and buy his memoir. And, um, and I encourage you all to support more Latino authors because we are out there. We are writing, you know, we're writing a lot. Uh, we're putting books out there. So I hope you guys can, can support. Thank you.